My next guest has been referred to as one of the best harmonica players of his generation. At 21, he placed first in the Sunny Boy Blues Society contest and has won numerous awards uh, since, including Mars National Harmonica Contest, Blues Critic Award for Harmonica Player of the Year, Best Harmonica Player at the Blues Music Awards, won a Grammy Award for the Best Blues Album for his work with Johnny Winder, and the Bernie Bray Harmonica Player of the Year Award. Here he is, folks, the Jason Nucci. Dun, dun, dun. How you doing, man? You doing all right? I'm okay. Great. Thanks, thanks, thanks Jamie. Yeah, you got it, man. Great. So I'm so grateful that you've agreed to be a part of this. So many people out there want a chance, uh, some insight into uh, Jason Ricci. Uh, and so here we go. We get we get to do it right here on the Harpslinger podcast. So thanks for being here. Uh, it's not like I'm that busy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, COVID's kind of got us all down. I mean, I know yeah. <laughs> for about 20 years. So here you are. You're in New Orleans. You have some time off with uh, loved ones. Uh, and you know, you think you're ever going to go back or are you just going to stay home from here on out? I'm going to go back, but, um, I'm going to go back a lot different. Like, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to prioritize things a little differently. Like I'm going to pick and choose mm -hmm. wh where we go and for how long and, uh, and with what outfit I tour with. So, you know, we're going to be putting like a lot of guest musicians, I thought you meant what clothing you're going to wear. No, no, no. Like the older, like 50s style outfit. Yeah. I love that term outfit. <laughs> I've that been hanging around this outfit for 20 years now. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally an old school musician term for sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm going to like have special guests on my bigger shows and stuff. Okay. Like Each one. So like the money is not the priority next year. I've learned I can live without very much money. Yeah. Right. And you do other things. I mean, you're, you're teaching. Right? Yes. Yes. I never, I really, I started teaching in 2013. So I had a, I had like a, a mock COVID uh, run in 20, uh, no, it was like 2012. Okay. I, uh, I, I went to jail for a year. Okay. And when I got out, they, uh, they were like, okay, you're, I was on probation for like another six or seven years. So they were like, you can't be in bars and you can't leave the state. So, you, so, yeah. So, like, I was like, oh, this, it was exactly like it is now, except it was just imposed on me. So I started teaching on Skype. I had never, everybody had been asking me for a few years, but it wasn't as big as it is now, right? So I kind of got in kind of early and uh, in, in a mass uh, student, you know, roster. Right. And, and got, and some of those guys are still with me from way back then. Nice. So it, so when COVID hit, it, and, and I never stopped. Like when I got off the road, I'd go out for a couple of weeks because, you know, even before COVID, bars were closing. And there, the time we used to go out for months at a time, like a couple months sometimes, some, sometimes three months, right, before we came home. Wow. And, and like now you, you go out for a week or two because there's just no place to play on right. Sunday through Thursday, right? right. Like every, all the clubs have closed and there's lo new laws and everything. It's really hard to like, and rent is going up and ASCAP and PMI fees for the clubs have shut them down. And right. you know, it's, it's tough. So, so like I was teaching when I wasn't on the road. So all that happened in March when, when the shutdown happened was, just put a little thing up on Facebook said, Hey, I got room for a few more guys and bang. Yeah. Just tons of emails and great students. And it's totally rewarding and it's nice. And yeah. Then, and you get to sleep in your bed at night. I, I know you're a cat lover. Yeah. It's clear yeah. Your mug there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Being with the cat is a plus big time. Yeah. I feel you. I'm, a, I'm an animal lover. We have a dog and you know, it's been like, it's been a blessing to be home. Yeah. What kind of pooch is it? We have a Yorkie, actually. Her name is Lulu. Oh, you got one of those little ones. Yeah. You know, we live in an apartment here in Nashville, Tennessee. So big dogs are sort of, uh, you know, maybe out of the, not out of the question, but more difficult. And, and uh, yeah, so, you know, when we first got started getting dogs, we had a, we had another Yorkie. And I'm like, can't we get a big dog? But I, we got this Yorkie and I fell in love. So, you know, it doesn't, uh, they don't have to be big to be dogs anymore, to be lovable. Okay. <laughs> guys, guys can love on small dogs too, right? 
Okay, yeah, all animals. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right, you're being very agreeable. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty agreeable. Yeah. yeah, you are pretty agreeable. Hey, man, so, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, all of the touring you've done over the last 20 years. Uh, I noticed when I was doing some background on you, uh, all the different places you've lived. You just mentioned that you were incarcerated in 2012. I mean, you've kind of lived a blues man's life. You've traveled extensively in jail you've had some brushes with the law uh you're still on 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 top um i i think it's a i mean you've lived three lifetimes all of these awards that you've won it's really spectacular man you you should write a memoir um we're working on it with a, a harmonica player out of england named patty wells um it spent we've been writing it for almost two years now so i, I was meeting with him like at least once a week for an hour or so Right. And we, we finished, we finished. And so he's writing it up now. And uh, what he's going to do is uh, send half of it to the publisher. Right. And when the publisher approves it, then we'll, he'll send the other, he'll write the other half and it'll come out. I don't, I don't know when, but, but yeah, no, I've lived all over. I was born in Maine. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> yep. Yep. And uh, when I was young, a buddy of mine, a skateboard buddy of mine moved out to Idaho. Okay. And I went out there to visit him when I was like 15 uh -huh. and it, it was great. Like I got laid and, and like partied and went to all these and I like got to skate on concrete that wasn't like affected by winter <laughs> stuff, you know? So it was like, I loved Boise. So when I, uh, when I got, I got my GED, I got kicked out of school young. I, I was homeless when I was like 16. So I, I was in shelters and finally got a job at the Olive Garden and got an apartment with some other hippie guys. And then, <laughs> then the school, I was in this really fancy, like dead poet society, private school. It's really strange because I grew up with a lot of money, but I grew up incredibly with incredibly unstable parents okay. and uh, with mental illness and drug addiction and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. And although money wasn't an issue, I suddenly at 16 didn't have any and was like just out there on my own, homeless, no place to live, kicked out of the house, no drugs, nothing, just a big mouth. And, you know, and I, I was a smart kid and, and I knew it and I was, and I was a dick and I was disrespectful to my mom and, and, you know, she, she wasn't a lot of fun either, you know, growing up, but, um, you know, I, I love her and she's doing the best she could. She had a tough break too. So anyway, I went out to college in Idaho to study wildlife management. Right on. Uh, yeah, I was playing harmonica. I it started when I was like thirteen or fourteen or fifteen, right around in there. I think I've had one forever, so it's kind of hard to say when I started because I would play it, but I but I started like studying it around fifteen. Okay, who were you studying with? Uh, There's this. It was my guitar teacher. Uh, I found out he taught harmonica. Mm -hmm. So one day, because a, a, another buddy of mine who was taking uh, guitar from him told me, oh, I took a harmonica lesson from Dave Daniels. That was the teacher. He was at the school I went to. Okay. So I just asked him one day, hey, can we do this instead? And that was it. And I just fell in love with the harmonica more than the guitar, even though I had been playing guitar like a year or something. So, uh -huh. so like... I was kind of good at harmonica. I went out to Idaho and then I ended up like in these in bars, like before I was supposed to be sitting in at open mics. And there was this guy that was really cool. And he like would give me 10 bucks to play at the jam. So it, so it was legal. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. And, and then, but like he required me to learn these songs like note for note. And if I didn't learn them, he would tell me I had to go home. And, and he did, he did. There were like weeks and weeks where I wasn't like not allowed to come back. Like, it was a different time than now. You could, you could probably get sued for that now. Right. You know what I mean? For, you know, you yeah. know, be, being firm and asking for what you want, <laughs> you know, that, that could actually help somebody develop and grow. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen these days. Yeah, maybe. So, yeah, so anyway, I was in Idaho for a little while and then I was like, you know, I'm kind of good at this and I'm making a little bit of money. Maybe I should go like somewhere where there's blues, right? Like besides Idaho, right? Uh -huh. So I had heard Pat Ramsey in right. Memphis. Right on. Okay. I was, yeah, I was just driving through and Billy Gibson too. Uh -huh. and, and Billy was like my age. 
Okay. He was also a Pat sort of protege, right? Like, you know, he was a, he was into a lot of guys. He was into chromatic and toots and everybody, uh -huh. even, even popper. But, but like, but we were all kind of under the tutelage of Pat, mm -hmm. the Reverend Pat Ramsey. So who was a crap stealer in Biloxi at the time who would drive up and do a Tuesday and Wednesday night show in Memphis. Okay. So I, I just moved there because I never, I was like a traditional little Walter, big Walter junior Wells, uh -huh. little bit of Butterfield like, but not like I wouldn't do it on stage. Right. right. Like, you know what I mean? Just traditional mm -hmm. guy. Like, and I heard Pat and I was like, Holy cats. Like you can play this thing kind of fancy and still, have soul and like Absolutely. you know yeah and i was like wow this this is different than like anything i've ever heard i better be around him so i told him i said i'm gonna move here and he's like yeah whatever right and like a couple of months i went home i landscaped got a thousand dollars and i moved to memphis so i was there for a little while and then pretty soon drugs like hard drugs like crack and other sh stuff like that yeah. landed me in a, like a pretty precarious situation and right around that time david kimbrough mm -hmm. and and uh gary burnside and Dwayne burnside and kenny kimbrough they're walking down yeah walking down the street down beale street at a little jimmy king gig and saw me playing on the sidewalk okay and they're they're like look we want to audition you we're looking for a horn player but maybe you'll work we like lee oscar we like war mm -hmm. and would you would you come to Holly Springs? So I was in Jet. I was in Holly Springs for a little over a year, playing with Junior Kimbrough and R.L. Burnside every Sunday, and some of the other gigs in Oxford and Senatobia, all yeah. around that area. Uh huh. After that, I ended up going south to Jackson, Mississippi, yeah. where I was in my first touring outfit that was hitting like three or four states regional called the hounds. And it was a six months on gig, six months off. Uh, the, uh, the six months off were because fingers Taylor from, from Jimmy Buffett would, yeah. he would work six months with Buffett and then he was off. So he would get my job at just automatically. Right. Yeah. Like, so I had to figure out what to do. So I started trying to sing, and do my own thing in Jackson and stuff like that. Again, drugs and alcohol and jail started to come back. I ended up catching some charges, so I ran away, went to rehab, mm -hmm. had some more problems down Florida. Okay. That was Florida, yeah. I uh, got in some more trouble down there because I didn't like what the rehab was telling me, so I left and got in all kinds of trouble and uh -huh. caught a felony charge. Did a, did a year yeah. and a day uh, in, a, in like a boot camp kind of drug facility, uh, not really jail, like you could smoke and right. there, were, there were girls, but you couldn't really talk to them. But, you know, yeah. yeah and but it was like boot camp. Right. So like that was good for me. Yeah. I was sober for 12 years after that. So like I went to uh, uh, meetings and I started playing in bands in Florida and yeah. I started and I learned overblowing and stuff like that. Then I moved briefly to Raleigh, then to Nashville, where you are. Mm -hmm. I, I lived there 10 years in, in wow. East Nashville, owned a home. I, I was in love with a beautiful guy named uh, Brady Mills, who was a graphic designer, is a graphic designer. Okay. We had a great life, put together a touring band. That was awesome. Finally moved to New Orleans, where I've always wanted to be uh -huh. since, since I first visited here in 95. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Like I said, you've lived like three lifetimes, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And oh yeah. In Indiana, right. I did a, did a year in jail up there too. Okay. Lived there, lived there for a few years. Yeah. Did they, did they let you have a harp when you were in jail? No, no, no. no. Not in prison. Some prisons will, Okay. But, but jail won't. Okay. Right on. So you were, you weren't playing at that time. You were kept no, in music. That's, that's, that's hell. Yeah, but I wrote lyrics and I uh, and I would run scales in my head, which uh -huh. you, it's very easy to do that and scale exercises. Uh -huh. I, I think I think arguably it's better training. 
than having the instrument in your mouth. I've heard of, of uh, concert pianists like uh, during World War II, Japanese play, you know, pre, you know, seeing the, the keyboard in their head and practicing sonatas and, pra you know, practicing their chops in jail, in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah I think you I think it's it's almost better. That, maybe it is better. I, I think it, I got out. I it took like uh, a couple of weeks to get my lips doing the muscles and stuff. Right. And I, I think I was better immediately. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was like I've been playing for a whole other year. Yeah, it was not a big deal. Right on, right on. You mentioned overblows. Uh, you were one of the first guys to start really integrating overblows into your music, right? I, I think I, I was one of the first people to kind of get popular for oh. it. Like, uh, you, you know, like at the time I didn't know anybody. Like I, 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 I Howard Levy, this is my lineage. Okay. Uh, How, Howard Levy taught... Uh, William Galliston, uh -huh. who, who taught Adam Gusso, right. who taught me. Okay. And then shortly after that, like I heard Carlos Del, Del Yunco. Right, right. He's great. Yeah, he's super cool. So like, so that was the only people I really knew about. But then I caught on to like Sebastian Charlier and like going over to Europe and stuff. And I found out that there was really like maybe hundreds okay. of people that just hadn't gained the notoriety that I did because mm -hmm. they, they weren't touring and like, and being in bars and getting talked about on the internet. But right. there, but I really think there were hundreds actually, you know, and now, now some of them have sort of, because of YouTube and stuff, we, we get to see that there, there are guys who've been overblowing, you know, as long, oh, oh yeah, like Michael Pelliquin, like Chris, Chris McCulloch, right? Like those guys were overblowing way before me. Like, you know, like e even Paul Messenger and, and, um, and other cats that were like, they were in it before me and, and Roscoe and Dennis and like the whole spa crew and Winslow and Yerksa and all, all those guys were all, they were all overblowing way before me. Okay. I just, I just like did it through an amp. And like, and like, you know what I mean? And blues and stuff and like right. funk. Yeah. that And so people were like, Ooh, you know, like, yeah. And I was in like touring outfits and I was playing with like Willie Big Eyes Smith and stuff like, so like people were like Junior Kimbrough. And so people were like, what is that? Right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's fantastic how it's open. It opens up your playing to a whole other world, right? I made the mistake one time of saying to a friend who played overblows and he's trying to, you know, he's like, man, you really got to learn this. And I'm like, I, you know, I haven't learned, you know, little Walter never played overblows. He goes, yes, but little Walter would have played little overblows if he'd known they existed, you know? Yeah, man. I, I, you know, I think so too, but like at the same time, I've never listened to little Walter or Kim or, or Dennis or Joe Felisco, I've never, and I've never gone, oh, well, if they would only overblow, then it would sound so, you, you know what I mean? It doesn't, it just doesn't matter, right? Okay. You know, right yeah. on, right on. I mean, if you want to play like what the band is playing, it matters. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. Speaking of playing with a lot of great people, uh, let's cut to uh, your, your, uh, your performance on... Uh, on, on that that Grammy Grammy winning winning record uh, with Johnny Winter, you know that uh, my babe for for crying out loud, you know the little Walter, yeah, classic. Uh, is it true you you did that in one take? Uh, yeah, it was it's, it's two takes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wasn't really, I'm not really proud of that performance, and uh, it was a pressured performance. Uh -huh. um, I don't think that the producer really wanted me on the record. Okay. Um, I played to a scratch track of scratch drums, scratch bass, scratch guitar, scratch vocals. None of none of those were the band. Uh -huh. That's that's on the record. Right, right, okay. Yeah, it wasn't Johnny Winter singing. wasn't him playing guitar. wasn't the bass player. wasn't the drummer. I was the first thing that would stay on mm -hmm. that recording. I walked in. I had no idea what song I was doing. I was told. Really? Uh, I was told you know, a minute or two before, uh -huh. the, before the track, what the song would be. Mm -hmm. I, I had, I heard the click in the, in the headphones. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was my babe. So I guessed mm -hmm. it was, it was in the original key. Oh, wow. The, 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 I still, my feet were, it was like eight in the morning. Um, it was, I was told six months before that I was going to do the recording. I didn't, I, I booked a tour to New York in order to do it. Yeah. I hadn't heard a thing from the producer 
from the, the moment he asked me to do the recording until the morning, six in the morning of the day of the performance. I had played in New York that night at Terra Blues until wow. four in the morning. Mm -hmm. I, I was on no sleep at all. I drove from New York City to Connecticut to do the recording. Right. I, I, I had called him repeatedly over the six months trying to confirm to get an address, to get a time, to find out how much money I was going to be paid. Mm -hmm. All these things, not, not a word, not a callback, not an email, not a text. The morning of the recording, the day he said it would be, he was right. Yeah. <laughs> he, answer, he answered the phone. Yeah. And he, I was about to go to bed and say, forget it. You know what I mean? I guess it's not happening. Yeah. So I, I, wa I had carried my amp and my pedal board through this field to get to the studio. Wow. My legs were covered in dew yeah. from the morning dew of the crabgrass that was, I was soaking wet. When the, when the click still happened, my amp, the tubes hadn't even warmed up and I was expected to play the two draw on my B flat harmonica was flat. <laughs> I, I begged, begged. There were breaks, breaks in the music uh -huh. like that are not on the original. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the song was, was, it sounded awful. It was like the, the vocals were like, my babe, don't stand. No, she eating. It was, it was just uh, no inspiration right. whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and like, so I begged for another take, and they're like, no. They're like, no. They're like, Johnny wasn't there. The, I wanted to do it in Indiana. I had a great studio. They, they wouldn't let me. They, the whole point was Johnny Winter wants to hang out with you, mm -hmm. and, then, and then he's not there. Right. So then he walks in while I'm arguing with the producer about giving me a second take. And he goes, and, and the, the producer's arguing that Johnny Winter only likes the first take, and that's it. And then Johnny walks in and says, well, what, what's the problem? He says, hey, he wants to play it again. He says, well, let him, let him try it again. Yeah. So I got a better take the second time. But, wow. Yeah. I've never heard a worse story about a studio, you know, experience. I mean, that's. Man, man. Yeah, it was rough. I, I can't even tell the whole story. Like, you know, without it, it'll be in the book, but. There's more. There's more. <sighs> man. Yeah. Biggest gig of my life. Right. And, that, and that's how it went down. You know, I don't like my tone. I don't like the way the amp was mic'd. You know what I mean? I, I just don't feel like I played it well. I felt like Kim would have done a better job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I got to tell you, uh, you know, I think the rest of us think you did a phenomenal job. You know, <laughs> God bless you. Yeah. You know, it was, it was interesting because at the end of that, I was like, uh, first of all, I thought I thought they could have given you more time on the record. Uh, on you know, but then and then I'm like toward the end of that song, uh, you know, Johnny's sort of singing it out, and and you sort of you're like, "F it, I'm gonna play some shit right here. I'm gonna leave some shit on this by the end of that track." And yeah, but that wasn't me. That was that was they just edited it in, and I had played the whole time over that, and they just chose porn. It's yeah. a collage. It's just a little collage of yeah. Wow, man. Well, you know what? I was. It's terrible to hear that, but it's it. <laughs> It was a good experience. It was a good experience. Yeah. <laughs> How prepared you you are just in general, and also to your stick to itiveness, your tenacity for your like. This guy hasn't called me back yet. I'm probably not going to get the session at all. But yeah. I'll be there on the doorstep waiting just in case. Right. Well, I mean, I love Johnny Winter, and and it was a Pat Ramsey oh. legacy. Mm -hmm. It was because of Pat I had the gig. Yeah. You know. It's yeah, like red hot and red hot and blue, right? Yeah, and Pat had continued to have a relationship with Johnny uh -huh. throughout the years, and 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 I had opened for Johnny Winter several times, and we had met, mm -hmm. and and he had mentioned me in an article okay. um, that he did out of nowhere. They said like, "Who are some of your favorite up and coming blues people?" or something like that. Like, what do you think's happening important in blues? And he mentioned me. Mm -hmm. So I had a feeling that there would be a relationship there, a phone call eventually. Right on. Did you ever yeah. think he was going to win the Grammy? I guess you did. After that experience, you're like, hell no. Though. I don't know if this could ever win a Grammy. I mean, this is the way they're cutting this record. Um, no, I, I wasn't. I didn't think my performance would make or break the record either way. I, I was just grateful to be on it, especially with the company of like 
Clapton. You know, it was, yeah, Clapton and Bonamassa and Paul Rogers and Dr. John, right? You know, all those guys. Uh, yeah, Brian Setzer. So, like, and then when Johnny died, I I knew it, it was going to win the Grammy. Right. I I knew. That yeah, makes sense. They, they, and he had not won a Grammy for his own recording, you know. Yeah, it was time. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm glad you were a part of it, despite the issues you had, you know. I mean, it you was awesome. It was awesome. And, like, Johnny was so cool, too. And he was. And we had the best talk after that. Great. All right. So it was worth it, you know. And that's something you'll totally. never do to anybody. You know? More than worth it. It was the honor of my life, regardless of how it went down, you know. Yeah. And the and 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 God bless the producer for you know you know he's just trying to do his job and he, you know he's got a lot on his plate and he told me the date and he was right that was the date right and it's not my fault that I didn't listen the first time and I panicked and freaked out like a fucking grom you know it's a great rock and roll story you wouldn't have this story without it right <laughs> no, no speaking of other great stories tell us a little about your experience uh on the induction for paul butterfield's blues band on the, you know the rock and roll hall of fame i mean yeah. you know, you're in great company for one thing you oh my god in a yeah ass suit bro you were the best dressed dude on that stage <laughs> and then you blew your face off i mean I, I, was, I watched it on HBO like the rest of the world, and I was like, you know, I, I like Tom Morello. I like Zach Brown. You know, I love Paul Schaefer. Uh, but you, uh, I mean, those, I hate to say it. Maybe I don't hate to say it. Those guys, they were like, oh, shit, we got to take another solo before he gets that last round. Because <laughs> you, you came back with them on the second go round and just like blew your, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. it was oh, God. Well, yeah, that one went a little better musically, but funny enough, it was wasn't too different than the other experience, right? Like, so first of all, I was really down on my luck. I had just gotten out of jail, was on probation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was like two hundred and fifty pounds. Okay, and I'm I'm generally a skinny guy. I'm big. I'm big again now. I'm not that big, but I'm almost right. Okay, right. but I'll I'll work it off. It you know <clears throat> anyway. I didn't feel very good about myself. You know, I didn't have my blonde hair. I was, you know, Dude, I got, it was, yeah. It was like your hair was perfect. All that jet black <laughs> slick back. You, going on, dude? I'm telling I was you. just trying to do like a butter thing. Like, you know, pay some homage. I, got it. I, I didn't have any clothes at all at the time that fit me. So I borrowed that red jacket, which was a Wrangler jacket <laughs> for my my neighbor, Jason, who, who was like also on probation. And we were like, you know, Indiana scum trash, you know, and he's like, don't worry. It's Wrangler. It's right. You're going you're to be a hit. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was great. Like yeah. <laughs> I walked out in the jacket and I, Willie Weeks turns to Felicia at college and, she, and he goes, my boy doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, yeah, the gig was terrible. Like I get there, right. I, I, okay. First of all, I wasn't supposed to be there. My probation officer wasn't allowed to let me leave okay. but she made an exception I, I got so lucky the judge my judge was a blues fan okay. and he and, and he had not he didn't know about me but he knew about paul butterfield and the rock and roll hall of fame mm -hmm. and, and, and my and my probation officer was a huge tom morello fan okay. so she's like just get me tom morello's autograph and you can go i mean i told her i'm like look you know I'm doing it. Like if I if I go to jail, yeah. Like so what? Like I'll do thirty days after this. You know what I mean? Like thirty yeah. days to me is nothing. It's, it's meditation, push ups, relaxation. You know, break from the TV. So, right. You know, yeah. I'm, yeah. I do thirty days. I, I'm grateful for thirty days. You know, that other than yeah, the nicotine's the only thing that bothers me about going to jail. You know, uh, everything else I'm cool with. I sleep good. Everything. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, please finish. <laughs> I'll talk all day, man. I, I, love, I love that. So let me ask you. Uh, I want. I, I did. I don't know if you had time to be nervous for this Johnny Winter thing, but for this for this thing, were there any nerves involved? Because I know that. Oh my you, god. Yeah. Brutal. That's a big deal. Brutal. Brutal. So I get up there early. Um, I'm trying to figure out like how to get in to the, the room, the Hall of Fame, 
Right. right. Like, yeah. Like I got my aunt on a hotel wheeling cart and stuff. Yep. And they're like, I get up there and they're giving me a hard time. And I'm like, I'm going to play tonight. And they're like, <laughs> let me see some ID. And I give them the ID. The woman who's in charge of giving you your credentials, your little badge, and they assign you a handler, right? That like mm -hmm. basically makes sure that you don't do drugs in the bathroom, right? That's basically his job, right? You know? Yeah. So like the woman who's taking it, she's like, which, which band are you with? And I said, the Paul Butterfield blues band. And she says to me, I swear to God, Jamie, she goes, am I supposed to know who that is? Oh Lord. I, I said today. Yes. yes. Today, today. Yes, you are. That's one of the bands that's being inducted. Yeah. So anyway, it was crazy. Like Paul McCartney's guitar was sitting, sitting right there. Like right next to me, just unattended. I could have just stole this Les Paul, right? Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was just crazy. So like they gave me my stuff. I, I, I decided I better load my equipment in now, mm -hmm. right? And they Nobody told me that I had to be there. I walk in to load the equipment. My band is rehearsing. I, I'm, I'm there what I think six to eight hours early. Yeah. To be safe. Right. No, nobody called me. Nobody contacted me. Nobody said, this is the time to be. So I walk in. I'm like, hey, guys, uh, me too, right? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, just set up over there. So I set my stuff up and I pl played a couple of notes in that giant amphitheater. Yeah. My amp sounded awesome. And yeah. And sure Felicia, yeah. Felicia Collins, is Tom Morell, everybody's looking over like, what the hell is that? Like, yeah never heard harmonica sound like that before paul schaefer comes over he's like jason we're so glad we got you you know it's what a pleasure to have you mm. and i'm like how did i get the gig right like how'd you guys hear about me and he, he told me the story that peter wolf got me the gig at wow okay i don't think it was true oh I really talk to peter wolf after the gig he I have no idea who you are, you know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay. I have still don't know how I got the gig. Anyway, I played my ass off. Luckily, I was terrified. I was in the audience. I didn't know when I was playing. Uh-huh. I'm sitting at a table, and my handler comes up. He goes, you're on next. Uh-uh. No idea. Like, you know, I go back there, and Morello's warming up, and, and, and Zach Brown, they're so nice. Both of those guys. I saw Both, I, yeah. If it wasn't for Zach Brown, my name wouldn't have even been mentioned. Right? They never said my name. Ever. Wow. Yeah, Zach Brown was the only one who said, oh, yeah, by the way, at the end of the show, by the way, Jason Ritchie was playing the Butterfield parts, yeah. I mean, the most important, look, the most important parts of that song were played by you, and that's a fact. That's a fact. Well, but, I mean, he was singing the lyrics, right? So that's a big thing. Great was, too. Yeah. Great but singing. thank you. Thank yeah. you. But, yeah, it was an, uh, the biggest thing is that Butter is a huge, huge influence on me. And, like, the, the only discernible influence on Pat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, huge lineage connection. Because, to me, it, it's Butter, Pat, you know, and, and, then, and then I come out of Pat. Yeah. So, so, like, I mean, just what an honor. Right. Like what an incredible honor to be part at all of that. And then the fact that I played OK is nice. <laughs> and all I was I was just praying backstage. I was like, OK, God, like whatever's going to happen, let it happen. The only thing I ask is like, don't trip on the way out and like make sure my amp works. Right. Like, that was it. like you just didn't want to fall down. Yeah out you know or have the amp not come on or something uh -huh. right right well you slayed it it was fantastic it's a, it was it's an epic performance and, and it's you know it's uh it's out there for the world to see for the rest of time it's you know it's a it's yeah a good deal. not one gig came out of it either <laughs> after that moment did it change you know it seems like <laughs> 12 and a half million viewers to this day of like i'm waiting for the call where someone's like hey i saw you on the rock and roll hall of fame you want to come play with me or whatever yeah nothing nothing you know i didn't not one studio session not one club nothing festival nothing i have 12 and a half million people is nothing that's nothing
Do you yeah. have a publicist? Because you maybe you need one. No. Dude, it's my own fault, bro. I've been spending years in jail and addiction and hiding and selling amps. And, you know, come on, man. But nobody's to blame but me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, like, I don't care about all that stuff, like, anymore. Like, you know, I, you know, I don't... I'm not trying to be a superstar. I, I just want to be the guy that meant it. You know, that that's all. Well, we, I mean, I think we all get that. When you play, like, there's an urgency there. You know, like, it's, uh, like, you, you're, you're, st you're stretching all the time to make, to make great music and uh, to take the instrument someplace new. That is absolutely clear to everyone, you know? And I mean, so I think, I think you've got that in spades. I think you've done, you've done that. Absolutely. Thanks, man. You, you know, like I did delay, you know, and, and Pat too, but like, but like Paul delay and stuff like that cat is just sincere, mm. you know? And I, and I, I resent when people think that if you play fast or at the speed of another instrument, <laughs> yeah, that that somehow translates into not having feeling. And I, I think like anybody that sees me live suddenly has that challenged if that's their paradigm, right? You know, like, and I know it was challenged for me when I saw Pat. Mm -hmm. You know, well, the, yeah. I don't think uh, I when I hear you play fast, you never never seems to me like you're playing fast for the sake of playing fast. Every now and then, I'll show off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right on. And, yeah, like once in a once in the set of the night, I'll do a virtuosic. Look what I can do! Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And if I'm on a gig with like Hummel, I won't do it. <laughs> Because I, I know Mark will tell his story later. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be watching this. He's a gem, man. He's all these guys have been like so nice to me, right? Like Rick Esther and everybody. Kim, it's taken a while for Kim to warm up to me. Yeah. <laughs> I think he is though. I think he's starting to like me. I mean, shucks, man. When you've been around a cat, you've seen somebody 20 years. Uh-huh backstage with the cheese and the celery and the french di the ranch dip and you, you know 20 years of that whether you like them or not or whether you approve of them or not musically you just start respecting each other it's like you know, same hotel room same cheese tray yep. same celery the, the flies all over it and shit you know you're just Absolutely. like how you doing bro like you go okay yeah i'm all right dog sick he's in the veterinary yeah, yeah it's just normal yeah i get it yeah. Hey, so tell me about uh, tell me about your your newest record. My chops are rolling. First, right, uh, right. Well, super cool. Uh, you know, I've i I'm a singer. I've done. I've, I've spoken about this on other podcasts before. Uh, I I I love your I love your vocals, man. You have a great rock vocal. What what do you have a lot of uh, rock and roll influences as far as singers go? I know that you know you've spoken about some of your harmonica influences, but. Who, who do you dig as far as vocals go? and Or, or is this just some, what comes out when you step up to the microphone? Uh, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I wasn't uh, ever good at like, uh, I, I was under the false impression that you were born with a voice mm -hmm. or, or you weren't. Right. And at, at no time did it occur to me that if I practiced singing, Mm -hmm. the same way that I practiced harmonica or guitar that I might get better. <laughs> it just never occurred to me. Right. So I spent a lot of years and a lot of albums prior to like the, I think it was, you know, the JJ Appleton dirty memory mm -hmm. when I was singing demon lover on that song and, and JJ gave me a vocal lesson. Okay. And then I was like, Oh, I should work on this. Yeah. And then, I started listening to Sean Costello. Okay. And and Sean and I had been friends since he was 15 before he passed away at 29. I don't know how many years ago. But Sean's voice really sent me. Mm -hmm. And and so did like Jamie Cullum, the jazz. Yeah, the, the yeah. sort of that raspy, limited range, octave and a half maybe. Some... some strained falsetto here and there but like i knew that was my range and but what i wanted i i, I was able in practice to imitate mm -hmm. other artists but i would never do it i on stage it right. felt the vocals are so personal 
and I felt such, like such a phony uh-huh. when I when I'd be like hey hey yo ho right like I just couldn't do it. It wasn't I could yeah even if it made me sound better. So it was like an onion where I was constantly stripping away and struggling to stay on pitch, you know, uh-huh. but like inspirationally like Lou Reed like was not a good vocalist but you could hear Lou. Yeah, he's and, a stylist. And, right, and the lyrics were strong. Uh-huh. And, yeah. and and delay too, Paul Delay, like mm-hmm. the, the the vulnerability that sometimes, like when you listen to that, my first time hearing Delay, I was like, I don't really know if he's good or not, like as a vocalist, like, but I know that he feels this right now, and yeah. there's this this phone, this t- like I don't know what to call it, this like human humanity, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, you mentioned that earlier, that's too, in there too, sure. But Sean, I think Sean Costello was the biggest influence vocally. But, but I've never been as good of a singer as Sean, and certainly not Pat. And you know, Pat Ramsey used to give me a hard time all the time. He, hey, you stole all my licks, and you can't sing your way out of a paper bag. You know, and he would tell me that. You know, yeah. again, again, nowadays it'd be a lawsuit. You know, right. suing suing you for you know, hurting my feelings. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's no longer a safe space in the harmonica world. No, there's not. <laughs> hey, you mentioned uh, songwriting. I noticed uh, that you you know you wrote almost all the tracks on this this new record, and, and and going further back into your discography, you've been writing songs for a long time. Yeah, uh, I think I, I feel like that's been you know I'm not one to like brag or anything, but I feel like it's been overlooked. I I think that content that I've delivered is so dark that people just like. I don't want to hear all that. You know what I mean? I wanted to ask you what you draw from. And, you know, the best answer I always feel like is, you know, I don't know if there's a best answer. That's probably not the way to put it. But a good answer is you draw from your life experience. and You write what you know. At least that's been what has worked for me in the past. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, you know, you now you've covered a gambit, too, of almost sort of different styles of, uh, of I don't want to say songwriting, but the uh, the topics that you've covered have been varied, you know, uh, just from album to album. Some some like you say were dark, like the toy. Boy, that's a that's a fucking song. I don't know right. If I say that on YouTube, I'll probably get shut down. I already okay. said that word like three times. Bro. Okay, great. Man, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. It's cool when you do it. I don't know if I. But uh, yeah, I uh, I just. Uh, so I wanted to know, you know, like, uh, how important is songwriting to you? Is this something that you're always doing that is just part of you being an artist? Or do you write toward your albums? Do you have, you like, you yeah. know, my concept for this next record, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to write. Uh, jump into that kind of stuff. For me. Okay. I think I've gotten lucky as a songwriter a few times. Like, songs like Broken Toy and a, mm-hmm. and a couple of others, like, I think I just got lucky like it was in me and I had to write it, you know, like struggling with sexuality and and like growing up rich, but being poor and like uh, not fitting into any particular mold. Mm -hmm. You know, is he a rock guy? Is he a blues guy? Is he a punk guy? Is he, you know, what Mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And like that song was easy to write. It just kind of came out like I, I wrote it on the while driving in the car, just all I wrote, like there were like 20 verses and I just took the best ones out of it. And I, mm-hmm. I wrote it in like five minutes in like Wyoming, right? Mm-hmm. Nebraska, <clears throat> something like that. So like, I think good songwriters, really good songwriters, they're, they're like musicians that like, like an improviser, they, they write every day. They, mm-hmm. they sit down and say, okay, here's an hour and I'm going to write mm-hmm. like JJ Appleton. Like he, he's a, you know, he gets paid hourly in some cases to write, you know what I mean? In Nashville, you know that there's, there's songwriting factories. Right. And those are the guys that are really good songwriters. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy that's occasionally gotten lucky from having some experience to draw on, Mm -hmm. but I'm not a practiced songwriter, nor is that my vocation. My, Mm -hmm. my primary vocation is an improviser over simple chords, that's it, right? That's, that's all I'm good at, really. I think I'm better at that than most guys. Yeah. Like, but but like, I'm not a great songwriter. I've gotten lucky. Most of my songs are about dope and the devil, which is why I haven't written a good song in like two years. 
because I'm like, I'm all about Jesus and good living now, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, you know, that's another experience to draw on too, you know? I mean, I'm uh, working on that. I'm working on that. It's hard for me. Like, well, one of the problems with Chops Are Rolling as an album was mm -hmm. it was the first album I wrote that wasn't full of, you know, prostitution and the and like devil worship and occult symbolism and right, you know right. alistair crowley and heroin and you know crack pipes and dirt on the floor and shit you know <laughs> but there's certainly a market for that right yeah but my album didn't do good chops are rolling is the least successful album i've ever made you know right on right on well hey tell me about uh how you've over the years developed your sound you know i remember um it's been years now going back and, and finding you on YouTube and you're talking about your pedal board. And I was, I was, you know, interested, really interested in that. And here you were sort of giving up all these tips for free, showing us what, what you were using at the time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I got online on, on eBay and I bought a bunch of those pedals, you know what I mean? And started working on my, yeah. my sound. Uh, are there any rules there? No rules at all. Uh, what, what do you, what do did you know when you're, is this something that you stumbled upon this, this sound that you have? Because I feel like it's, it's very unique to you and it's super cool. Uh, and then I want to talk about the pedals that you've developed with, with Lone Wolf. Also. Cool. That's fun. So yeah, like, I mean, <clears throat> when I listen back to my, like the recordings where I started to kind of come into my own sound, like, so that would be like some of the independent recordings prior to the Delta Groove, mm -hmm. the Collecto Groove stuff. So like, I think like the, the record that kind of, sticks out as sort of sounding where I start to sound like me is uh, probably the one called blood on the road, which is, a, mm -hmm. was an independent release. Very few copies were sold a few thousand, I think, no, 12, 12,000 were sold uh, yeah. by hand by us out of the yeah. van. Um, an, an admirable, that's a lot of records these days, actually. Yeah, I guess so. But you, you know, the thing is like, even then I sort of still sound like I kind of do now. I mean, there's a little bit, there's a definite refinement that happened through adding more pedals or changing how I approach the microphones, the way I play the uh -huh. amount. I knew a lot more tongue blocking now than I used to. And right. so, so things have changed a little bit, but like the, the basic sound was just there. And I don't know where that came from. I, I think that the 57 microphone was the biggest change, right? Cause the, the bullet mic compresses and distorts on its own. Right. And, and that and that compression and distortion is fixed and limited mm -hmm. to that microphone. Right. And even models of the same year and make model mm -hmm. will sound different than that one that you have. Right, right. And, and I think when I got sick of that, like because it got stolen... And I was needed, and, and I found the 57, and I discovered that you could turn the amp up louder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With, you, you know, and it wouldn't feed back as much. Yeah. And then the, I was getting more distortion from the amp itself than the microphone. And then it was just a matter of, okay, well, how do I compress it a little? Like, I would go to the studio, and I would record, and it didn't sound the way I wanted to, but I liked it. But then I, the studio would do something to it. And right. I'd say, do that thing that and I didn't know what it was. And, and that thing was compression. Yeah. And, and that's what bullet mics do. They compress and they distort. <clears throat> but so when I discovered the, the first real pedal that influenced my sound was not like a delay pedal, or which I had messed with, you know, but I wasn't far from the first guy to mess with the delay pedal. I mean, there's recordings of Mad Cat from the 70s playing through pedals and Will Scarlet from wah pedals. And uh, again, like overblows, I think I get undue credit. Now, I do think I was the first guy to put the board together. And like, you know, I, I know Johnny Mars was in, in there too from England, but, but like the real, the guy to like say, okay, look, this goes first and this goes second and try this and try that. Like, you know, I hung out with a lot of guitar players okay. like Pat Ramsey guitar, not sa everybody else like, Oh, saxophone, saxophone's my main answer. I'm a Lester young guy. And then they play wah, 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 wah. and it was like, what horn lick? was that like what lester you i sound like little walter to me you know uh -huh. oh little walter was influenced by lester young so so am i so 
No, you're not. You know, I, I listen to guitar players. Yeah. I, I was going back and forth with them mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah. So I was just trying to do those licks, you, you know, to impress them and to hold my own and to be part of the evening and mm-hmm. the audience. And right. and that's like how my style was made, whether it was country or blues. or So compression, when I found out that effect was compression, that was the first pedal that started Jason's sound. Right. Yeah. And because I could turn the amp up really loud and get distortion. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't a problem. The 57 was acting like a pickup on a guitar right. that broadcast my signal naturally. Right. I, I could add a little compression by cupping it. Mm-hmm. Okay. A little distortion by cupping it. But I could also back off of that. Same as on a bullet, but it didn't sound like it was coming through a walkie talkie. Right, right. It's you're right. It sounded like a harmonica. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. And not this disconnected sort of sound that I enjoy. I enjoy listening to bullet players. And don't get me wrong, I frequently question myself. I'm I'm constantly in a self examinatory state of yeah. well, well, screw all this nonsense. Let me just get a good bullet and play through the amp. The thing is, I, I just don't like not being able to adjust right. the, the, to the song, uh-huh. right? To the evening, to the gig. Uh-huh. Is, it, is it a jazz gig? Is it a funk gig? Is it a traditional blues gig? I could turn a knob and I have an, a turner. I can turn another knob and it sounds like Butterfield. I could, yeah, it's easy. I can use the same amp at a coffee shop or the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't have a variety of amplifiers. There's two amplifiers in this house, and one of them's for fun. I like it. You know, it's like I got it in a, at a club. It was in a puddle. You know, <laughs> like I, I rescued it. It's a rescue. Yeah, right. So, so like, yeah, compression was the first one. Yeah, and then it was, so it was just a matter of you know distortion and compression. Right, and that you, so then you ended up with the flat cat, right? The flat cat was the first pedal. When Randy Landry of Lone Wolf, mm-hmm. who's been working with me since uh, 2010. Yeah. Um, so he came to me. I was on playing on the street, uh, all cracked out, you know, on during Jazz Fest. I must have made like $400, right? Like in an hour. Uh, mm-hmm. the Jazz Fest was over. And they were walking back to their cars. Mm-hmm from the fairgrounds i lived right across the street went out there with a little battery powered amp mm-hmm. started playing it was four hundred dollars right and then uh randy walks up to me i didn't know who he was and he was like hey look uh aren't you jason ritchie and i was like yeah i'm like surprised you recognize me i was like 135 pounds you know like just messed up messed up cigarette burns on my arm just horrible horrible shape mm-hmm. he's like look He's like, I'm going to go to my car. I'm going to get you a few things. So he brought me a few pedals. Wow. And uh, the heartbreak was one and the harp attack was another. And I grew to like those and, uh, you know, stopped using the Kinder anti-feedback, uh-huh. which was, it's a great device, yeah. but, but like a bullet, it's very fixed. Right. Right. It, it's, it's not real adjustable. Uh-huh. So there's a, it adds a certain amount of distortion and you can't really stop it from doing that. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, I think in most cases, it's just enough. It's a yeah. good sound, mm-hmm. but but I, I can't change it, right? Mm-hmm. And that, You like that, options. Yeah. So yeah. I started working with Randy. He stayed with me all the time. And in 2011 or 12, when I got out of jail, he's like, what's the first signature pedal you want to make? And I said, compression. Mm-hmm. And, and his heart sank. Because, you know, to this day, it's the least popular pedal we sell. But if you want to sound like me, that's the pedal. Yeah. But it's it's very confusing to harmonica players because they plug into a compression pedal and it sounds worse. And what they don't realize is you have to adjust everything else and then right. then compress it. So you turn the amp up really, really loud. Then you put the compression. That drops the volume. But you have this different sound. Mm-hmm. And also the other thing is compression is not necessary on smaller amps yeah. like on on a 110 or they're already the amps are already compressing mm-hmm. they're already doing that so you really have to have an understanding of what compression is doing right. in order and and I knew very very well 
what compression does and how it works before I even knew it was called compression. Right. Because you were right. you, you dug it in the studio. You were figuring it out. Yeah. Right. Right. Right on. So, yeah. So I knew it was an optical compressor, too, mm -hmm. that I wanted. And I experimented with many other kinds of guitar compressors to, and really didn't like them. So it was, yeah, it was, it was actually the Boss Octave OC3. Okay, okay. Or OC2, the OC2. I had discovered if you, by accident, if you turn the octaves down and turn the volume up, that it compressed, which was a, was a flaw yeah. of the pedal. The OC3 doesn't do that. Right on. Incredible. I think That's how, yeah. Dude, you might be a genius. <laughs> I'm like Inspector Gadget, bro. I like Forrest Gump. I like fall into things and go, what? Oh, yeah, I meant to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I don't know about, yeah. I think you're just always, we mentioned this earlier, you're always tr pushing the envelope, which is incredible. And so many of us are benefiting from from uh, you doing that, you know? It's oh, man. Well, a lot of... A lot of companies benefited besides Lone Wolf too, and it never gave me any money either. You know. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's probably the way of the world, right? It sucks. Yeah. But uh, Lone Wolf has been great for you. I mean, you had the flat cat. You've uh, you've got the clean cat and this yeah. this signature series microphone that you've got out now. I mean, that's uh, I mean, you're like the Eddie Van Halen sort of. Is that a bad reference? I hope. Hell no. <laughs> I think it's love, great. love that. Guy. Yeah, maybe the, you know, like the Jimmy Jimmy Hendrix of uh, of. I'll take Van Halen, man. Yeah. Eruption, eruption. Yeah, baby. I'll, I know, yeah. right? That's, that's uh, our pat. That's growing up for us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, uh, you know, Randy's been incredible. Like, he's worked with me. That all of the pedals have been a lot of fun for me, and I, you know, I'm quite dependent upon him now. You know, yeah. Well, I'd almost rather play acoustic than just through a, an amp. You know, I'd rather play through the PA. Yeah. That than not have my setup. You uh -huh. know. I hear that. Okay, cool. Well, you, man, uh, a cup. Just a couple more things before we let you go. I don't want to take up your whole Saturday here, but take but it I up. Take it up. <laughs> Clearly, we we have to do this again because there's so much. Uh, that we could talk about. There's just it's it's pretty amazing, and you are an open book, and that's. I really appreciate that. That's really dope. Um, so, well, what's next for you? You know, uh, COVID is here, as we mm -hmm. talked about a little earlier. But uh, you know, what? What's are you going to hit the road? Or, you know, like a, a crazy person? No, you're gonna you're gonna figure out. Just go out and just do, you know, sort of scheduled touring. But you're definitely going to get out. You're going to put out a new record, maybe. What do you think? Um, I don't think that there's going to be a 2021 for us. So yeah. that's just a guess. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly not planning on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think my agent is, <laughs> but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, yeah. uh, so I'm not planning. Um, what I'm, what I want to do is uh, I would like to do some records. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to do, I'm working with a pianist named Joe crown, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, organ player and uh, some great new Orleans musicians, mm -hmm. Doug Belote, who's with Charlie Hunter and Robin Ford and uh, a bunch of other people. Uh, working with that drummer and uh, and a guitar player named John Fole, who was with jo Dr. John for 17 years and works with another fantastic harmonica player down here named Johnny Sansone. Mm -hmm. Talk talk about vocals too. Wow, really cool. And Johnny and I have started to get to be friends and work together. I think we're going to do a two harmonica thing with uh, Joe, with Joe Crown, uh -huh. like an acoustic piano double harmonica guitar thing. But I want to record a, a, a funk jazz, New Orleans funk record with Joe, and like we do at the Maple Leaf. Okay. And so, yeah, I want to do that. I'm working with J.P. Soares right now on a, uh, we, we have four songs in the can already uh, with, a, with a band called the Gypsy, uh, Gypsy Blues Review, which is a, a mixture of Django. Uh -huh. It's like Django meets uh, like Ronnie Earl. Right. Like it's like a combination of like of of gypsy music, a lot of uh, harmonic minor stuff, mm -hmm. which I play most of it in, in in third position. So I do. But some of it's in fourth or fifth. But that that gig, I, I'll be in like a 
I'll be in third position for like 80, 90% of the show, right? Right. All harmonic minor stuff. It's really uh, fun and, and difficult too and uh, hard stuff to learn. The violinist in that group is Ann Harris from uh, from uh, uh, from all these different bands. Uh, you know, Otis yeah. Taylor's band. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's amazing. We, so it's violin and harmonica, which have very similar texture. Uh, yeah, right. We're, we've got a few songs that already recorded. We have a label. I can't say who it is okay. that wants to make another record of me. My next record for me under my name is going to be totally traditional blues as much as I can do that, mm -hmm. which, okay. which, isn't, which isn't much because I don't have the vocals for it. But but I'm working on it and I'm practicing. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. do some Snooks Eaglin tunes, some cover songs, and some uh, you know some just straight up blues stuff. Yeah. I'm probably gonna use Nick Moss and yeah. Rod Rodrigo, the bass player. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll use JP. Uh, we'll record with Damon Fowler. Um, I will uh, still be using members of my band, but but sparingly, right. sparingly. My my guys are great Jason guys. But they're not great traditional blues players. Uh, other than my drummer. My drummer can do anything. John Perkins can do anything. And he's a pleasure to be around. <laughs> and that's part of it. The hang is half, half the battle. But yeah, but John Lisi will be on the record for sure and be featured on Lisi-esque types of things. He's an incredible rhythm player too, which yeah. is r really where he shines. You know, he's an interesting lead player, but very a great team player. And I work with John too and in his band around here. So I'm staying very, very busy. I'm, you know, what I, uh, so I, I plan to release some records and see how they do. Um, and hopefully we're, we're going to sign with this wonderful label that's doing a lot of work right now in the blues world. Great. And I, I wish I could say it, but it's not done yeah. deal yet. Yeah. Man, I'm so excited for you. There's a lot on the on the horizon for you, and that's just absolutely fantastic. You know, maybe this has been the gift that you needed this downtime to be able to formulate these ideas, uh, to not have to be on. You know, the the whole dog and pony show out on the road. You're able to uh, get home and sort of center yourself again and figure out what you want to do next. It's uh, it's really exciting. I do, I want to say too, man, your band is really good. You know, and you guys are very very talented. Thanks, Hi South. Yeah. Right on. Man, and you're you're a great harp player, and you go all the way up the whole thing and come down. You go up to ten blow and down, and yeah, you, and you can play in major, and then you can stop and play in minor, right, without mixing them all up together like a you know, right, like needlessly. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I I wanted to talk about you more, but oh no, man, this is all yeah. about you. Nobody wants to hear about me. They want to hear about Jason Ricci. Absolutely, yeah. but I appreciate that. That's what abs thank you so much yeah and you know we love what we do we're a harmony band you know and we love to sing. that's why i always talk a little bit about songwriting and singing if i can because i'm just so impressed by those skills you know those are things that i try to uh to be really good at in addition to being a harp player and uh, i just you know i love it when when i can sort of have that that extra little thing to talk about with guys and and uh, you're that guy i mean you you do it all so it's uh yeah i don't know I'm digging it. All right, one more question for you before we get to the lick of the week. Uh, Connecticut rapper or Maduro? <laughs> Connecticut in the morning. Maduro after a steak or a good meal. Nice. Okay. I can never, never Connecticut at night. You'll waste it. Yeah. You got to have that sucker on nearly an empty stomach to really taste it. Okay. It's, otherwise, it's too light, and you can't get into the subtlety of a Connecticut. Right. That's right. Most people don't get that can, how awesome Connecticut's are, but you gotta have them early. But you have to have a Connecticut before you're actually ready for the cigar okay. to enjoy it. Yeah, that's how you get the subtleness out of it. Yeah. Right on. Right. Are on. you a cigar smoker? I like cigars. Absolutely. I. I, I Dude. I, yeah, I, I, I dig them. <laughs> See that humidor over there? Look at that sucker. Oh, wow, man. Right there, yeah, Look yeah. The humidor, it's, it's so big. That's incredible. All right, I'm yeah. definitely... About 500 cigars in there, too. I have yeah. humidor envy. I have cigar envy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. So, uh, all right, so as you know, uh, I, I mentioned this to you briefly, and I always feel like I'm springing this on people, and I don't know if that's, that's quite fair. That's not my intention, but, uh, you know... 
I ask all the artists that we have on the Harpslinger podcast if they wouldn't mind throwing us a bone and and doing a, a lick, a lick of any kind, any something that's moving them right now. It could be something they play a lot, something that whatever. It doesn't matter, but we'd just love to uh, to hear you. I, I'm not allowed to play. Because oh, that's right. Because that's of right. My, because of my eye. That's right. That's right. right. You, know, you discussed that, and I forgot. My bad. I, I want to do it. But but I actually don't know what the lick is. No, no, yeah. So let me think of a lick. Okay, the lick of the week it, it, it is uh, take, go listen to Paul. I'll tell you my favorite harmonica solo of all time. Perfect. This is even. This is great. All right. Like it's hard to find. Okay, it's off an album uh, called uh, "Take It from the Turnaround." It's a du double album on a obscure Portland record label okay. that it's difficult to find. It's not okay. even on iTunes, right? Okay. I don't think it, the song is silly smile so and the greatest harmonica solo of all time. It can, it contains grit, purity, humor, anger, beauty, joy, sadness. I love it. Covers it all. Fancy. It's like, yeah, it's like a Charlie Parker solo, except yeah. on a harmonica. Right on, man. Right. Yeah. Jason, man, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I mean, I can't tell you what it means to me to have you on the show. It's uh, you know, it's been it's been mind blowing actually, like to get to hang out with you for an hour. So, man, I've, you can hang out with me anytime. Well, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. Skype me up sometime. We'll just and I'll ask you more about you. I'll shut up for five minutes and listen. Oh, it was good. No, it's great. Appreciate you so much. Uh, good luck with the eye. I know everything's going to be good. Uh, and uh, yeah. We'll see you down the road, my friend. Peace and love to you. God bless you. Thank you. Take care, brother.